walk through the application process. But as you learned this morning, there is not one application process. There are 11 application processes. So what I decided I would try and do is give you the general framework for the application process and then give you an overview of the four agencies that are the most typical for, um, because of the four of the, four of the five largest. I am guessing a lot of the information I will cover with NSF is the same information that Jesus would have covered. So while it's always really helpful and interesting to hear it from the agency themselves and to establish a relationship with them, I think most of the information that he was going to cover you'll, you'll get in the next few minutes. So first and foremost, and you've already heard it both from me and from the speakers of just now, you got to understand the agency, you got to understand what the agency wants. Number two, the reviewers and how the proposal is reviewed. And each agency has its own unique or different ways of doing the reviewing. Who the reviewers are. Um, the planning, I said before, it's the strategic planning, it's building the team, it's finding the resources, it's framing the project, it's understanding the commercialization strategy. Once you get that, then there are the rules. And then there's also the registrations and then there's allowing enough time. So those are the kind of general processes. I'm going to take you through a scan of the four agencies. Stop me if you have any questions, and then we'll try and tie it all together with a little bit of commercialization. The first agency that I've got queued up for us to cover is the National Science Foundation. Who in here thinks they have an interest in the National Science Foundation? Okay, a number of folks. One of the interesting things is you all potentially should have raised your hands. Any of you who are developing technologies appropriate for SBIR, with the exception of those of you who might be developing therapeutics, potentially have a fit with the National Science Foundation. They are the broadest of all the agencies, at least all the granting agencies, when it comes to what they fund. They are a granting agency. They are investigator initiated, therefore. And as you can see from their mission, it is extremely broad. NSF funds anything and everything under the sun with the exception of therapeutics. The problem is their mission is much bigger than their budget. So NSF has a very, very broad mission and a very narrow budget when it comes to um, the scope of SBIR. Okay? One of the reasons I like NSF so very much is that they're a bit like the canary in the coal mine. They're a real bellwether for, talk about using a bunch of um, cliches. They really, really take the concept of technology innovation combined with commercial merit as seriously as any of the agencies. Um, I can look back over the years, I've done this for 17 years, the woman who actually started BBC, my consulting practice, wrote the first NIH SBIR grant to be funded in the state of Michigan, one of the first in the country in the 1980s. So we have looked at this program for a really long time and worked with it for a really long time. And NSF has always taken the concept of high risk technologies towards solving problems in the market through commercialization, very, very literally, long before any of the other agencies did. So you're looking at high risk, high payback, they don't fund anything related to basic research. And they are one of the highest bars to get over because they will hold you to the highest of standards when it comes to the quality of your science, but also tied to validated, and I'll talk about that a little bit, commercialization strategy. They have a bunch of things that are considered non-responsive. A lot of you asked me some general questions this morning about your, your projects and whether you've already got a prototype that kind of works, if you add more stuff to it, is this appropriate for SBIR? You're really looking at NSF at really, I hate buzzwords again, but paradigm shifting, enabling, really um, cutting edge, their words, revolutionary technologies, but you have to have validated commercialization. So some of the things you see up here, not relevant for SBIR and STTR. None of the agencies are allowed to cover any um, business development related costs associated with SBIR and STTR. Um, you can see many examples for agencies like NIH where it appears to be evolutionary technology as opposed to revolutionary technology. And again, NSF says we fund revolutionary, not evolutionary technologies. Um, they are most aligned as an agency with NIH and the types of thing they fund, but they will be much more um, discriminating as far as how um, challenging the technology is. You can't really compare NSF or NIH to DOD. They're different beasts, and you'll see it a little bit. What DOD funds, um, whether it meets anyone's definition of technological innovation, is kind of immaterial. If DOD chooses to pick a topic and put it in their civil solicitation, that topic is there, and they're looking for people to fund it. Okay? 
The way NSF runs their program is as follows. And again, keep in mind, every agency runs their program differently. NSF has two, and this can change, but currently they have two SBIR phase one solicitations per year. They've had two for quite a number of years now. They have a winter one and a summer one. So we are currently in what I call the summer one. The solicitation was released in March and proposals are due in early June. They tend to have another one where the solicitation is released in August with proposals due in December. I will show you the technical areas of the SBIR solicitation in a minute. They are their broad-based, consistently applied technology areas that have been around for many years. This year, they did something different with their STTR than they did last year. Last year, they had a completely different and very narrow topic area for their STTR. This year, they've changed the focus of their STTR. They are now no longer technologically focused. Their STTR is as broad as their SBIR. But they are giving priority, strong favor, to projects that have what's defined as NSF lineage. And I mentioned that before. About two years ago, NSF added a section to their proposal, which really only requires a couple of sentences. But it says, is there any NSF lineage? That says the technologies to be developed into this SBIR product is their prior NSF research funding that contributed to your moving forward with this project. And in the STTR, they are giving strong preference. And whenever you see the words strong preference, that's a hint that if you don't meet that criteria, it's probably not worth your time. Strong preference to projects with um, NSF lineage. Oh, the way that they do their phase twos, so NSF is very timely. If you submit a proposal for the June deadline, you will know by December whether or not NSF is going to fund you and you will have your money in January. They very much want you to stick to the six month time frame. So they want you to finish your phase one at the end of June. And you then have two subsequent deadlines to submit your phase two. You can either submit in July or in January. So either one month or six months after the completion of your phase one, you have to submit your phase two. So for those of you who are doing um, quite well technically with your phase one, you can get a phase two in very quickly. For those of you who need more time, who haven't quite achieved your milestones, you've got another six months to keep going, whether it's a no cost extension or with your own funds to try and achieve the milestones that you need to move to phase two. So that's the timing of their phase one and their phase two. Make sense? Okay. This is what their website looks like, the current open solicitations are. There's a description of their SBIR program, and this is where the solicitations are. One of the things that I find challenging is every agency's website is structured differently. Some are better than others. They will all have a lot of background information on SBIR, STTR eligibility rules. Then they will also have solicitations that you have to download. The solicitations will tend to have instructions to them, there may be technical topic sections to them, and then there'll be the actual application itself. So where you find the solicitations are in that top big, big bubble there for NSF, and those will be the phase one solicitations. The topic areas that are covered in the current NSF solicitation for both SBIR and STTR are shown here. They're very broad. They've been in place a long time at NSF. As many of the NSF program directors have shared with my training classes in the past, they tend to say something like the following, with the exception of therapeutics. If you're developing something that doesn't fit into one of these four categories, you are doing something really out there. So these are intended intentionally to be very broad. So you've got biological and chemical technologies, education applications, electronics, information, and communication technologies, nanotechnology, advanced materials, and manufacturing. They refer to these as topics, but I don't like to refer to them as topics. And actually, one time I was doing a training class and one of Jesus' colleagues, Ben Schrag, was in the group listening. And I said, I like to think of these in terms of buckets. And they have big, huge buckets, and then you're gonna see in a minute there are sub-buckets within the buckets. Because topic, to me, implies something very specific and narrow, like DOD. A DOD topic is very specific and narrow. And NSF, topic area is very broad. And in fact, it was really interesting, Ben stood up and said, that's exactly how we refer to them internally in NSF, is very large buckets. So within these buckets, there are sub-buckets. When you apply to NSF, you are going to have to identify the actual little bucket. So that will be biological and chemical technologies, BC001, and I'll show you an example in a minute. 
but you need to fit into one of the little buckets. NSF will always favor really revolutionary technology with compelling commercialization strategies over the specific fit of the technology in the bucket. Does that make sense? This is an example of, from biological um, and chemical technologies. So you've got biological technologies, biomedical technologies. These all fall, and there's quite a lot of them. I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 40 of them that fall under that PC. And then what'll happen is you'll pick a topic and a subtopic. And then you'll see here, there's a program officer associated with each topic, that here's Jesus. So if any of you are doing drug delivery, this, uh, this is when it from last time, these change sometimes. Um, and they're very broad. If you can read this, proposed projects should focus on transformational, there's another good word, right? That's a buzzword. Of diagnostic technologies. Projects might include, but are not limited to, minimally invasive diagnostic detection, monitoring, biomarker, assays, point of care. That's motherhood and apple pie as far as diagnostics are concerned. Okay, so that's how broad those buckets are. It's really important, and I cannot re-emphasize enough what Matt said before. Appropriately Developing a relationship with program staff is very, very important. But every agency has its own culture and way to do that, okay? Right out of the NSF solicitation, it says importance of communication with a program officer, okay? So here's an interesting thing, as you'll see in a minute, the NSF solicitation for the last few years has said, if you are planning on responding, and know that NSF released this in March, okay, early March. The deadline's the middle of June. On the first page of the solicitation, it says, we strongly encourage, so that means do it, okay? We strongly encourage you to submit a one to two page executive summary to the relevant program officer to get NSF's feedback. And yet when I, people will call me, and right now our phones are starting to ring about NSF with three weeks left. And we're going, well, okay. Yes, it's pretty hard to put together a proposal in three weeks, but what did the program director say when you submitted your executive summary? And it's, of course, quiet on the other end of the phone. Oh, did you not submit the executive? No, you always ask, well, have you read the solicitation? Oh, yeah, I've read it. Well, did you, you know, what did they say about the free? Well, I, I didn't send one. Wait, and you told me you read the solicitation. They want this one to two page executive summary. That's how you start your communication with NSF. It also says, the earlier in the process, the more likely you are to get good, solid feedback from us. That's then your entree to start a dialogue with them. And usually what they will do with this executive summary is either, as was said earlier, encourage or discourage you from pursuing a full proposal. They'll encourage or discourage you based essentially on the depth and relevance of the technology and some semblance of knowledge of a credible commercialization plan. Okay? And if they really like what you're proposing and they see some weaknesses in that executive summary, they will provide you with a lot of feedback as to what you're going to need to do to be deemed competitive in an NSF review process. So I can't re-emphasize enough how important it is to talk with them, all right? If you're planning a June submission, and a couple of people in here might be, you should already have read the solicitation and identified a topic and a subtopic. You should already have contacted the NSF program director with your one to two page executive summary. You should already have registered in Fastlane and at sbir.gov. And Fastlane, it's NSF's electronic submission system. So again, you're going to see each, there's different processes. Fastlane is NSF's system. It's a server-based system. You have to register in the system. And then as you start working on your project, we're going to be uploading various components to different fields in Fastlane. And then when it comes time for the deadline, your whole set of information will be sent out to NSF for processing and review. So registering Fastlane and learning how to use it early in the process are important. And then you need to develop your preliminary project budget. Why do you need to develop your budget so early? You gotta make sure you fit within those SBIR or STTR guidelines, okay? So these are things that those of you who are interested in NSF or the existing solicitations should have already done. For those of you who want to look to NSF in the future, and I encourage most of you to do so, you want to know that in August, when they release the next solicitation for SBIR, these are the, this is the stuff you've got to look at early on, okay? I think I've said all of this already, but NSF is really critical on a viable commercial product. They want high risk, um, and then you can also address other intangibles, but they're really looking at high risk, high payback commercialization. The one to two page executive summary. Um, some, one of the presenters um, talked about the fact 
and you have to really adjust your 10 slide PowerPoint deck, I have to tell you, some very compelling stuff here. I have a really strong bias in how I always want to see a presentation from anybody in this area. I don't ever want to see you start out with a statement of the technology or the product. I want to know the problem you're trying to solve. I don't care about your technology if I first don't know the problem it's going to solve and the impact that your technology would have in solving the problem. So in this to one to two page executive summary that NSF asks for, here's the general outline. And we're big proponents of outlines. Um, anytime you find a solicitation, the first thing you should do after reading it for the second thing, first thing you do is read it five times. The second thing is to start creating outlines for yourself. Outlines for each component that you have to write, and then timelines for how you're going to pull the things together. I get asked a lot from people, well, do you have any sample proposals that we can see? And the answer is no, for two reasons. One, most proposals are proprietary. Nobody likes their proposals because it contains all kinds of proprietary technical information be made publicly available. Number two, even if they did, I don't think that helps you much because your technology is different than his technology. But it's that outline of what goes into that section that's going to help you tell your story properly. So NSF wants information on the company. They want to know who you are. They want to know if you've got any SBIR experience, any commercialization experience. They want to know the opportunity in the market, the problem you're going to solve. Okay, not the technology first, the problem in the market. Then they want to know the technology innovation, the product it's going to go into, and then the competition. Who else is trying to solve this problem and how are they trying to solve it? That says they know who you are, they know what you're trying to do, they know why you're trying to do it, and they know that you're cognizant of what else is going on in this field that you've got to compete with as you move towards the market. And then they're going to review that and get back to and assess whether or not the technologies that you've proposed are quote unquote revolutionary enough and whether your commercialization strategy seems to be sound. Okay? So that's a really good litmus test and something you should be able to, um, to write right now and send it into them for their review. Okay? And you've got a breakdown here with some more questions about the kinds of things they're looking for. The origins of the team, how many employees, revenue history, have you taken previous products to market, um, experience with previous SBIR awards, the target market, who the customer is, how their needs will be addressed, and the estimated size of the market opportunity. I want to address something that was mentioned by one of the panelists, and it was spot on, and it might have been Matt when he talked about some of the mistakes that he'd made. Oh no, so whoever was talking about the NIH review criteria, significance, you should, guys should know these by heart, by the way, significance, innovation, investigators, approach, environment. Those are five great, great, great review criteria. The review criteria of innovation. This was absolutely spot on right about how hard it is to get reviewers to deal with whether or not what you're doing is innovative. And I'm going to tell you one of the simplest ways to address that. Go back and look at the last time you wrote a proposal and see if there was a sentence in there, if you've written SBIRs, that said the technological innovation in this project is. If you can't state what it is, they're not going to be able to find it. If you can state what it is, but you don't, don't assume that they're going to intuit it. So the statement of what you deem to be the technological innovation, and it's sometimes because you invented something new, you identified, you created something new, you discovered something new. Sometimes it's, to many of your points, taking a technology that works in field A and modifying it appropriately and applying it to field B, which might be very different. That can be technological innovation. So don't make the reviewers work hard for it. What's the technological innovation stated? Where does it fit in this field? So here's another way we position technological innovation. It's not deemed technologically innovative in an absolute case. It's relevant. It's relative case. So you position your technology based on everything else that's being done in your field. You are not deemed to be qualified to work in this field if you don't know everything that everyone else is doing and can't present it and provide justification for why, even though there's a whole other body of knowledge out there, there's still a gap in knowledge, I like that term a lot, that's yet to be filled to help address this problem. So in your technological innovation, what is the innovation? How is it going to address the need by filling a gap that current technologies can't solve? How big is the problem? And what's the product? You've always got to say what the product is. And then the competition, we take a look at how else it's trying to be addressed in the market. Okay. 
So that's what NSF wants to see in a two-page executive summary. Um, focus on near-term commercialization. Now, we talked earlier this morning about validation of commercialization and letters of commitment or letters of support. About two to three years ago, NSF started asking, in phase one, for applicants to provide up to three letters of support from commercialization partners or resources. That's essentially how the instructions read. What that says is, essentially, NSF wants to know two things. You're stating there's a problem in the market. Are you the only person who thinks there's a problem in the market, or do others in the market think there's a problem? And two, have you already started not only thinking about commercialization, but talking to the resources that you're going to need to ultimately get there? So it's one thing to get a letter of support from someone, but it's another thing to know that you were able to go out and start talking to them early in the process. NSF is trying to force commercialization more and more upstream earlier in the process, and by making you get those letters, or strongly encouraging you to get those letters, it's forcing you to talk to those commercialization resources early, which provides market validation, and it also shows NSF that you're thinking about commercialization early in the process. So they're very important for NSF. So what I want to do is show you for the four agencies that we're going to cover, I'm going to give you a brief outline of what goes in their proposals. I want you to see how different they are, but I want you to understand that the components that go in are essentially the same. You always have to tell them what you're going to do with their money. So that's the how. That's the research strategy. It's the technical plan. Whatever it is that you're going to go into your research facility and develop. But that's necessary, but not sufficient. You also typically have to tell them, especially for the granting agencies like NSF, why the world needs this. So if DOD puts out a topic and say, we need 10-foot antennas that can be three-dimensionally printed on mylar, then you know at least the DOD says, we need antennas. But if you go to NSF and you say, we're proposing to develop new three-dimensional antennas, they're going to say, why? So writing a proposal to a granting agency like NIH or NSF is harder than writing a proposal to a contracting agency. I will tell, and that's my opinion based on my experience, and here's the primary reason why. For a contracting agency, your highest priority is to show them how you can deliver on the objectives or the milestones or the outcomes that they've asked for. I can deliver that. I can make that. I can achieve that. I can deliver it. In a granting agency, since they don't want anything specific, you not only have to tell them what you can deliver, but you have to convince them why the world needs it. So the rationale and justification for investigator-initiated projects like at NIH and NSF is incumbent upon you to prove, okay? So here's what an NSF proposal lays out like. There are 10 different sections that have to go in it. The other thing you have to be careful of as you go to pursue writing a proposal is not to compare apples and oranges. Page counts for different agencies include and exclude different things. So at NSF, there's a cover sheet that the system develops. You've got a project summary. Other agencies call it an abstract. In NSF's case, they want two 200-word paragraphs. One has to start with the broad, uh, the, they're the two review criteria, the broader impact. You'll see them in a minute. Um, and you have to have those words in the two paragraphs. If you don't have those words in the two paragraphs, guess what NSF will do? Reject your proposal as non-responsive without review. So they are looking for any excuse not to review it, and an excuse is a very good excuse is you couldn't read the instructions properly. Can't read the instructions properly, we're not going to take the time to review it. So you've got two 200 word paragraphs for the um, project summary. That's the information that will become publicly available if you are funded. You've then got a table of contents, and then you've got your project description, which I'm going to show you a brief outline of that in a minute. That's maximum 15 pages. Okay? You then also have references, you have biographical sketches. You have budget and budget justification. You have information about other support for the key personnel to make sure they're not overcommitted. You have facilities, equipment, and other resources. And then you have some very limited supplemental documentation, the primary piece of which is your three letters of support. All proposals, you need to tell them, that's what I started before, what you're going to do, so that's the research strategy or how you're going to do it, why it's important to do, who's going to do it, where you're going to do it, how much money it's going to take to do it, and how you're going to spend that money. That's common in every proposal, but how it's laid out will vary by agency. So that's how NSF asks for it. And then if you break out that 15 pages, you'll see they want identification and significance of the innovation, background and phase one technical objectives, 
your phase one research plan, three to five of the 15 pages on commercialization, information on who else you're bringing from outside the company to the project, which is your consultants and your subcontractors. They want to know if there's any overlapping proposals that you've submitted, and then that concept of lineage. They want to know if there's any NSF lineage in the project. Any questions on these 15 pages which fit into that bigger framework? So it's the, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Why is it important to fund? Who is doing it? Where are you doing it? How much is it going to cost? How are you going to spend the money? Is, is this list literal from their Yes, this list is literal from their RFP. Yes, so this is these are the 10 sections that you must have. And for this one section, that's the 15 pages. That must have seven sections. What I do below these is give you further outline breakdown, okay? But this is the NSF structure. Yes, sir? I asked you earlier, but uh, in terms of preliminary data, does that apply to NSF? And all yeah. The so the question is, does preliminary data apply? In general, when you have preliminary data, it strengthens the overall proposal. That's a general comment. No agency has a firm requirement for preliminary data. Preliminary data to NIH reviewers probably has more, um, is of more import than to an NSF reviewer, okay? But preliminary data will never hurt you, okay? Yeah, so this is a very good question. So the question is, there's no place in here that he sees to put information about the company. So how are they going to know if you're a one-person startup or a 35-person ongoing concern with product? The section here called Facilities, Equipment, and Other Resources is one of the places where you're going to, if you work with me, describe the company and the other resources and expertise that the company has. So that's one place. Another place you're going to describe it is here in the identification and significance of the innovation. You're going to also put a little bit on the company. So we'll build in for you, or recommending, that you put some information about the company. There are also forms you're going to fill out, and then in the budget and the budget justification. So there are places within all of those sections where you're going to be able to put information on the company. In addition, if you notice the commercial potential section, there's what's the market opportunity, what's the description of the company and the team. Okay? So biographical sketches. Your company needs to have people who are doing the R&D. Every proposal requires specific, detailed information about the scientific and technical team. In NSF, it's separate biographical sketches that go into that section, and they will give you guidelines on how to prepare those. NIH has a different guideline. DOD has a different guideline. But they all require detailed information on each key person, each key scientific or technical person in the project. Okay? So building that again, what are you going to do, where are you going to do it, how are you going to do it, who's going to do it, how much is it going to cost? All has to be planned out ahead of time. By the time you get to here to start writing it, you've already pulled all that together. That's all the planning. Okay? This is um, briefly a, a, how NSF's review process works. You can look through that flow chart. They've got it on their website. I'm sure Jesus was going to go over it. Um, NSF is external peer review. Your proposal is going to go to one of seven or eight program directors. Jesus is one of them, Ruth Schum and Ben Schreg. There's seven or eight of them, each with different technical areas of expertise. When your proposal goes to them, it will also go to the administrative back room at NSF, which assembles review panels. Peer reviewers, people from outside of NSF, comprised of both scientists from academia and scientists from industry and business and commercial expertise from industry. And collectively, those groups will be convened by scientific or technical discipline. They will review your proposals. That review will then be provided to the program director who makes the final funding decisions. One of the reasons why you can talk to personnel at agencies like NIH and NSF anytime you want is because they use an external peer review system and they award grants. By using external peer review, if I talk to Jesus and we're buds, we're like this, he loves what I'm doing, he thinks it's great, but the external peer reviewers think I wrote a really lousy proposal and score it poorly, when Jesus gets the results back, he's not going to be happy with me. Because he's going to say, Lisa, I wanted to fund this. And the reviewers all gave you poors and fairs. 
And the way that NSF ranks their proposals is qualitatively on a scale from excellent, very good, good, poor, fair, non-responsive or something like that. In order for him to be able to make a recommendation to fund me, I have to get pretty much all excellence, maybe one or two very goods. Or he doesn't have the external validation to be able to recommend me for funding. Part of what they're going to try and do, if it's a project that we're interested in, is help coach you in that dialogue to the things they know the reviewers are going to be looking for because they want you to come out the other end with a good review. If they're excited about your technology, they want to fund it, you have to pass the peer review process. So that's why that dialogue with the program director early in the process is so critical because they will give you hints and input and they can do it because they're not the reviewers as to what they know the reviewers are going to be looking for because if they want it, it's got to get some peer review. Does that make sense? Okay. And so that's why that's a simplified version. So for those of you who submit in June, um, you'll have a project start date of January 1st, 2014. They're very timely in NSF. Okay? Um, here's another interesting thing that differs by agency. NSF actually allows you to suggest up to three people who you think might be suitable for viewers on the project. Okay? So that's different than some of the other agencies. There are the two words that I was talking about. The review criteria at NSF are intellectual merit and broader impact. Those are two categories, and when you read their solicitation, you'll see a definition of intellectual merit, you'll see a definition of broader impact. Those two 200 word paragraphs that you have to write, one says the intellectual merit in this project is, one says the broader impacts of this project are, has to have those words. One of the things that entrepreneurs seem not to get is that the more simple you make it, the more straightforward you make it, the more you hold the reviewer's hands through the review criteria, the happier they are. Okay? Simple, straightforward, give me the five things I'm looking for, let me assess them in a straightforward manner, I'm a much happier reviewer. Okay? So here's your uh, reviewer instructions for intellectual merit. We've got, if it's a phase one, to establish feasibility. We have to look at how qualified the team is. We have to see how cutting edge your technology is. We have to see that you know the field, therefore what you're doing is at the forefront of this field. And then on the broader impacts, one of the things that NSF has as a culture is societal benefits, but if it's SBIR, it has to have commercial benefit first. If there's no commercial impact, we don't care about societal benefits. Okay, so you've got to have commercial impact if it's SBIR. Does it lead to a marketable product? Not just a product, but a marketable product with a competitive advantage. And is the project positioned to attract further non-SBIR funding? Even in your phase one, if you can't already address how you're going to secure the additional resources you need, very relevant to the question that was asked earlier about how am I going to get stuff beyond SBIR. I don't know. You've got to figure that out. That's that whole idea of putting yourself out there and saying, here's the hypothesis. Here's the problem in the market. Here's the product. Here's how I can solve the problem. Do you agree? Would you fund this? Do you see the commercial impact? And would you be willing to invest, partner, collaborate? Okay? And then you get this excellent through poor. is how NSF reviews their proposals. So you need to do your homework. And every agency, as I mentioned before, has a database where you can search previously funded projects. If, in fact, you go on NSF's main web page, you'll see right on their main SBIR web page towards the bottom, Click here to see other recent SBIR funded projects. They're trying to hit you over the head with the fact that they want you to look and see what they're funding. Number one, they don't want to fund something they've already funded. But more importantly, because if what you're doing really is that innovative, they probably haven't. Or they funded another approach to solve that problem. But if the problem is important enough, it's worth funding multiple approaches. They want to know that you've done your homework to see the kinds of things that they're interested in funding and how they're framed. Okay? So make sure you do that. That's at their um, searchable database. And then from an electronic submission standpoint, NSF uses Fastlane. You have to register in Fastlane. As I mentioned a bit ago, Fastlane is a server-based system. You're going to be uploading information to Fastlane. Here's one of many stupid mistakes that I've lived through in 17 years. I lived through them with my clients, fortunately. We don't usually make them, they do, because we, we learn from them. Had a client call once saying, 
I came here at NIH training, they said it was really good, but I'm calling with an NSF question. I actually just submitted an NSF proposal two weeks ago, and we had a little bit of issue with electronic submission through Fastlane, and of course, when were we submitting the proposal? We sat down at 4 o'clock on the day it was due, and the due date was 5 o'clock, and we had some issues uploading it to their servers, and we were finally able to get the proposal uploaded at 501, and the system took it. So they all went off and celebrated, and then I went, Whoa! We got the proposal, and, and two weeks later, they got a letter from NSF saying they were rejected as not responsive without review for submitting their proposal one minute late. Okay? So they're absolutely dead serious about the deadline, and the system will take your proposal. They'll just reject it after they get it, and it sits on their desks, and they laugh a while longer and say, I guess they didn't get it when we said the deadline was 5 o'clock, not 501. So deadlines are very important, okay? Um, and there's no paper associated with Fastlane. <laughs> Anyone here use grants.gov? Okay, so you know how, how what a challenge grants.gov is. Fastlane's a lot easier. Okay, here's the deal with Fastlane though. I have a new appreciation for grants.gov. NIH uses grants.gov, Department of Energy uses grants.gov, Department of Agriculture uses grants.gov. If you can get over the fact that you all want to wait till the last minute, and if these guys treat the deadline for NIH as August 1st, not August 5th, if they submit something through grants.gov and they didn't read the instructions carefully enough and they put a wrong digit in the wrong field, grants.gov will reject their application with errors and as long as they still have a few days, guess what they can do? Fix the errors. Guess what Fastlane doesn't do? They don't give you any errors. You put a document in the wrong field, you'll get that letter two weeks later from NSF saying you've been rejected as non-responsive without review because you uploaded a document to the additional documents slot instead of the supplemental documents slot, okay? So you have to read instructions. Fastlane is not difficult to use. It does require registrations. As I went through just before lunch, everybody has to have an EIN number, a DUNS number, a bank account, and be registered in SAM, the System for Awards Management, and now you also have to be registered in SBI or DECA. Those are five prerequisites. There are then additional registration requirements for every agency, depending on which system they're using. Okay? So there's a link to, on NSF's website to Fastlane, and it'll give you a heads up on what's going on with Fastlane. Okay? So that's my little walk through NSF. Any questions on NSF? Why not therapeutics? So here's the deal, and you should ask them that too, but the one reason that they don't like therapeutics is just the length of time and the amount of money. So when NSF says they're focused on, if you go back to one of those early slides I showed you, they talked about being focused on near-term commercialization. I think the word near-term is kind of funny. It's at least four years out, okay? So that's how they define near-term, but not 14. And for therapeutics, for them, is just too big of a sinkhole. But they do a lot of devices, diagnostics, um, healthcare IT, but just not therapeutics. Okay? Probiotics. Pardon me? Probiotics. Probiotics. Hmm. I don't know. Can't answer that. How do we answer that? Understood. We go into that. I don't know for sure. Let's go into their database and look. Okay? All right. <coughs> we're going to take a completely opposite tact, and we're going to go to the other side of the spectrum, and we're going to look at Department of Defense. Okay? Then we're going to look at NIH, then we'll look at Department of Energy. Department of Defense is the largest organization. My guess is you can get more first-hand knowledge. You've got an absolute ringer sitting in the back with Mesoscribe. Very impressive. Love the presentation, and you should talk with him because working with DOD strategically is something very different than using NIH or NSF not um, investigator-initiating grants. Okay? Same overall eligibility rules, but DOD is an agency that is looking to solve internal problems and is an agency that's primarily procurement focused, uses their DOD CIBR dollars and their STTR dollars to target specific needs that they think are appropriate for the small business community. Here's the deal with DOD though. It's really not just one big agency. There's 10 or 11 awarding components within DOD. And if you talk to Army and then you walk down the, you're at a national conference and you go talk to Army, and then you go talk to Air Force, you're going to hear very different things. And some of the things that Army does with their cyber piss off Air Force. And some of the things that Air Force does are different than Navy, okay? So how they generate their topics and the types of things they're looking for and how they align those topics with their various procurement needs differs between the components. 
but across the board, DOD as a contracting agency is topic driven, and that's the biggest piece you need to know. The topic areas that they fund are extremely diverse. I don't think there's probably anything that you guys are doing that doesn't have some fit in DOD, including therapeutics. However, the issue is you can no longer be completely strategic with DOD unless you start out from the very inception of your company with a DOD procurement focus. You have to be somewhat opportunistic because you don't know when a topic's going to come out that's going to be appropriate for you. Here's the current DOD schedule. This might change a little bit from year to year, but typically they have three SBIR or three CIBR and two STTR solicitations. They are only open for eight weeks. So here's the other challenge with DOD. They pre-release the topics. The pre-release topics are out there for four weeks. Each topic has a lot of detail. I'm gonna show you an example. They say, here's the topic. Here's what we want in phase one. Here's what we want in phase two. Here's the DOD commercialization objective, and here's the dual use commercialization objective, many of them say, which is also not only what they want to see um, as far as commercialization to them, but commercialization to the private sectors, okay? And then here's the TPOC, the technical point of contact. That information is out there for four weeks, and you are encouraged to contact the TPOC to discuss your project during those four weeks. And you are absolutely crazy if you don't do that. Now you can see that the current DOD Cyber solicitation was released April 24th, and it was in pre-release until May 24th. Guess when our phones are starting to ring now about DOD? Now, and we just sit there and we bang our heads against the wall. My colleague Becky is our DOD expert. Where were the phones on April 24th and April 25th when people were starting to plan their projects? And now, if they haven't already talked to the TPOC, they can't. Now the solicitation is open to accept proposals, and since it's a contract solicitation, once it opens to accepting proposals, you cannot talk to the TPOX anymore. The only way you can get questions answered is in a public venue. They have a system called CITUS. I always forget what CITUS is, System for Interactive, whatever. If you post a question anonymously, it's there online, and they post the answer publicly for everyone to see. I always recommend that everybody who's pursuing a DOD CIBR um, check CITUS on a regular basis to see who else has posted questions. But if you didn't already get your questions answered in the pre-release period, you've already missed a big opportunity. So you can see that the current DOD CIBR solicitation closes on June 26th. And then you can see that there will be um, another DOD solicitation and then a concomitant but with different topics, STTR solicitation. And that will fill out fiscal year 2013. Okay, and then you'll look to see the 2014 um, calendar will start in November. Do they normally keep the same months? The question is, do they normally keep the same months? They typically have had a schedule similar to this for the last few years, although the STTR is varied. Okay, um, this was the 2013-1 solicitation. Um, the, the current ones will look similar. So this isn't the one that's open now, this is the previous one. But it just shows you that Army, Navy, Air Force, Chemical and Biological Defense, DARPA, and the Special Operations Command were the components that participated in that first solicitation. And if you go here, what you're gonna see is there are solicitation instructions, and then there are the topics for each of the components participating in that solicitation. So first, you gotta find a topic. Second, hopefully you found it with enough time to communicate with the TPOC. Third, you gotta read the instructions and then you've gotta be very clear about which component your topic is with because within one set of instructions, there might be different rules for Army than for Navy than for Air Force. Different page limits, different budgets, one has an option, another doesn't have an option, and you probably don't know what the option is, but, and I can explain some of that to you, but differences between the components. So DOD is by no means a homogeneous organization. Okay? Um, this just gives you examples of topics. Topics are extremely specific. I don't know, James, can I ask you one question? Were you strategic, opportunistic, or both with your DOD cyber topics? Did you help influence the topics? Did you respond to topics that were just there? They did both. They did both. You get, you can see topics, you can develop dialogue, and then get them interested, and then you'll see a topic release that's aligned with, with your technology. Um, your first one, was it opportunistic? Did you see a topic and go for it? And I ask that a lot of my dealers because I'm curious, and that's a common answer is we start, we started the company, we saw a topic, we went, woohoo, we can 
do this. And then you start to figure out where within the various components there's opportunity. You become more proactive, you reach out to them, and you may start to see additional topics come out. There tends to be the perception that if a topic is there, it's already rigged for someone else. So why should I bother if I see a topic? It's already like rigged for him and his antennas. I'm not going to bother. He's already had 29 of them. In general, DOD likes competition. Okay? They like to fund, on average, two to three companies for each phase one topic. So I always try and explain to folks, if this is something that you think you can fulfill, you're crazy not to go after it if working with the Department of Defense fits with your company's longer term strategy. Because they like competition, they're going to fund more than one. So maybe he did the legwork to influence the topic, but maybe he's living on his laurels and can't write a good proposal, and you come in with a great proposal, and you could as equally be funded. So don't ever assume that just because a topic looks like it's targeted for someone else, there's not the opportunity for you to compete. As I mentioned earlier, DOD is now subject to the new reauthorization provisions, which preclude them from invitation-only phase twos. So now the phase two has to be an open competition, open to all phase one awardees, not just those that DOD chooses to down select. We will see how they implement this. This is just getting started this year, okay? Here shows you the relative participation by the major components of the Department of Defense. And as I mentioned, Army, Navy, and Air Force are pretty much the largest. And then you've got DARPA, Missile Defense, Office of Secretary of Defense, and then a bunch of other little ones that will come in or out of the DOD super solicitation. Their phase ones are almost always fixed price contracts, and their phase twos are contracts where you will negotiate the terms of the contract. They will have a not to exceed, and it will vary by component potentially. One thing I want to note, although I don't know how they're going to be treating options going forward, there's something called a phase one option. Phase one option, and the Army has used phase one options a lot. I don't know what your experience has been, but they've used phase one options a lot. So what happens is, you put in your phase one proposal, you receive a fixed price contract. Here's $100,000 delivered. You have six months delivered. You then put in your phase two. If they want to fund you for the phase two, you're not going to go through a DCAA audit and contract negotiations. And they want to get you started quickly. If they want to fund your phase two, they don't want you to have to wait until the whole negotiation is done before they can fund it. So many of the components use what's called the phase one option which is essentially gap money. It's money that you can get once they choose you for a phase two, while you're going through the negotiations, they will give you, they will award you the option to get you started. But here's the kicker with the option. You have to ask for it in your phase one proposal. If you neglect to ask for it in your phase one proposal, you can't retroactively go back and ask for it after they've recommended you apply for the phase two. And I just had someone in a training course a few months ago stand up and say, serious, and I said, made the comment, why anyone would not ask for the option is beyond me. Ms. Quick, I stood up, he said, well, I didn't. And I'm like, why not? He said, because I kind of didn't get what it was. It was just, I didn't get it. So I figured, well, if I don't get it, I must not. And then, of course, he was recommended for phase two, and I don't remember it was a $25,000 option. Just didn't get it, okay? I think you're going to see this change a little bit oh, as DOD adapts to the new reauthorization guidelines, but if you see an option offered with the phase one, please read it very carefully, and if they tell you that this is something you can get, continue on getting a phase two. Make sure to ask for your option. Okay? Yeah? So what do I refer by negotiation? So in a phase two, you might be able to negotiate the financial terms of the contract. How it's in, whether it's a firm fixed price, whether it's a cost plus contract, and you will have to make sure you're going to go through a proactive audit by DCAA, which is the Defense Contract Audit Authority, Association, Agency, Agency? Yeah, Defense Contract Audit Agency, okay? So you're going to have to work with them to negotiate the terms of the contract. Whoever said, whichever of the speakers talked about setting up your charts of accounts and your financial control systems right from the minute you get your first dollar to keeping it simple was spot on. That just made a lot of sense. Okay? So, so that's what I mean by negotiating the terms of the phase two. All right. And then phase three. You will hear a lot about phase three SIBRs. I want to clarify something. What, who remembers what the definition of phase three is? Commercialization. Commercialization. 
Here's the deal, that $2.5 billion pot of money that's set aside for SBIR cannot be spent on phase three. So when you hear someone say they got a phase three SIBR, it didn't come out of that money. What that means is they got a follow-on contract from the government in some way, shape, or form to continue funding the R&D up to and through potential procurement, okay? It's what the goal is for a contracting agency is a phase three SIBR contract but it can come from a whole variety of different places, including the agency can just choose to continue to fund you with other pots of money to keep going. There's something that DOD has called the technology readiness level. I don't remember if I've got a slide in here or not, so I'll talk about it just very briefly. But TR levels talk about where you are in the development of technologies until the point at which DOD is ready to um, integrate that solution into their procurement. If I remember my TR levels correctly, and it's not my area of expertise, they say the most SBIR started at what, TR level two or three and ended TR level four or five. Procurement is TR level nine, so what do we have in the middle? A gap, right? Which is where they can come and give you additional phase three funding. Sometimes it's more R&D funding to get you to the point where you're at a technology readiness level, which also typically means you're partnered with someone at that point, typically a prime contractor to get integrated into the DOD procurement chain. So there is this gap in DOD that has to be addressed and that's what they can do with other buckets of money. DOD is running a lot of programs lately with the various components to take civil awardees and bring them together with prime contractors and other commercial partners to try and facilitate transition into phase three, okay? This is an example of what a topic will look like where they're gonna tell you what they want in phase one, what they want in phase two, what they want in phase three, and then who the uh, reference is and who the contact people are, okay? We already talked about this. You have to respond to a topic, so you are either opportunistic in finding a, a topic or you're strategic in trying to influence a topic that will come out in a future solicitation. A TPOC is the technical point of contact. It's an important person for you, and if you want to do some strategic work, try and find prior TPOCs in topic areas that might be relevant to what you're doing. I showed you that this morning, sbir.gov and zyf.com, where you can search past topics. And um, there is no agency that doesn't want to talk to you. You just have to know how and when to talk to them. So you don't want to call the TPOC when a contract solicitation is open. They can't talk to you. But reaching out to them prior to that is very is highly advisable. And then search their database of previously funded projects. Guess what? DOD has their own electronic submission system. It's not Fastlane. It's not the, the granting agency system. It's their own electronic submission system through which you have to be registered and through which you're going to upload your proposal and develop your budget. Okay. So you're going to need your EIN number, your DUNS number. Um, you're going to need to be registered in SAM. So all the things that I talked to you about before in order to, um, to get it registered in the DOD system. I strongly encourage you to sign up for the DOD list search. We run lots of training courses on all of the agencies, and it's very easy for me to schedule NIH and NSF training courses and get people there. It's very hard to run DOD training. It's easy to pick the date, but you never know who should come until they see the topics, right? And then you've only got eight weeks. So I think one of the most important things that you can do, and one of the important things that economic developers can do, is the day the topics come out, you should be looking at them as companies, you should be looking at them if you're an EIR, SBDC should be looking at them for their tech companies, and jamming them down the throats of the companies that they might be eligible for very quickly in the process. Said this topic is here, it's out for eight weeks and eight weeks only, this is the time for you to look at it and see if you're poised to respond, okay? So the topic date releases drive everything with Department of Defense. So if you sign up for their listserv, you'll know when the topics are coming out and you should just clear your calendars and look at them and see if there's something relevant for you. Did you miss any key points in DOD? Anyone have any questions about DOD? It's a big agency. It's a diverse agency. They're as different as can be from NIH and NSF. They've got the most money, um, and it can be a phenomenal place um, to get funded by, but strategically, it's a very different thing than building an IT company funded by NSF. 